Hello guys, I hope you're doing well. I'm invited now to an interview on a Russian TV. I think the name of the TV channel is NTV. They're going to ask me around 10 questions about the recent developments in the Middle East, from Turkey to Syria, Saudi Arabia, Iran, etc. And uh, they're going to record the interview. And of course, they, later they choose some segments from my answers. But I'm going to record the entire interview on my um, camera. And I'm going to post the questions and the answers now at, in length just exclusively on Syrian analysis, so stay tuned. The Arab League as a collective organization doesn't have a political and economic weight unless it is reformed and its decisions are being implemented. However, the decision to readmit Syria to the Arab League is an, in my opinion, diplomatic effort by Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates in order to normalize relations again with Assad. This is a sign of normalization with Assad and not a big, let's say, victory for Syria itself. Because these regional governments tried in the past years to unseat Assad in collaboration with the CIA, right? But this project has failed and the Arabic countries have learned from the experience that as much as they try to unseat Assad or fight against him with military means and military tools, Assad was going more and more on the side of Iran, something that Saudi Arabia, the UAE and other regional countries do not like to see. The main conflict between Syria and the regional, other regional countries, especially in Saudi Arabia, in Riyadh and Dubai, was that Syria was too close to Iran from their perspective. Therefore, they tried to replace Assad. But now, after the regime change war that erupted in 2011, they, seen, they have seen that Syria, this was just a counterproductive policy. Syria went more on the side of Iran because there was an existential threat. So they're replacing their strategy now from a military strategy into a diplomatic strategy in order to bring Syria back, as they say, to the Arab world. But from the Syrian perspective, Syria says that they are not compromising on their principled foreign policy approach in the region, and they're going to keep their strategic relationship with Iran. But at the same time, they're going to have or pursue diplomatic and good relations with the Arabic countries so that these countries can play also a role in reconstruction but also diplomatic role with the United States in order to lift the sanctions in the future and also the withdrawal of the U.S. occupation forces from Syria. In 2011 and 2012, the Arab League came under heavy influence of Qatar, which was tasked by the United States to reshape the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa, on the basis that Qatar and Turkey must give the Muslim Brotherhood leading roles in the region. Let's remember what happened in 2011. The Muslim Brotherhood came to power in Tunisia with the support of Qatar and Turkey. The Muslim Brotherhood came to power in Egypt with the support of Qatar and also Turkey. And the Muslim Brotherhood played an instrumental role also in Libya in 2011 in the process of NATO to unseat Gaddafi from power. So the Muslim Brotherhood gained huge momentum and huge influence in North Africa, but also they tried to project this power on the Middle East through the gate of Syria. And what happened is that Syria was steadfast. Syria fought back. President Bashar al-Assad decided to use its military power against the armed insurgency that was headed by the Muslim Brotherhood. But when the situation got out of control and there was a spawn of the Al-Qaeda in Syria, al al nusra and ISIS, Syria called its allies, especially Hezbollah, Iran and Russia in order to come for help because the amount of military support to these radical groups in Syria was too big and they have spent over $200 billion in the process of training and supporting and arming these radical groups in Syria. And Syria doesn't have half of this budget to uh, finance its uh, military budget, right, or its defense budget. So re Syria resorted to its allies. And now this policy led into crushing the backbone of the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria. But there are some countries who still reject the Syria's readmission to the Arab League. And on top of that is Qatar, because Qatar invested too much and so much in the region in the process of reshaping the Middle East and having a, a big, bigger role than the tiny size of Qatar, which was, as I mentioned, tasked by the CIA, according to the former foreign minister and prime minister of Qatar, Hamad bin Jassim, who confessed this on a Qatari national TV in the last two or three years. And we have another country, Morocco, that we still rejects Syria's readmission to the Arab League because in the mid-80s, Syria recognized West Sahara as an um, independent entity. 
And then in early 90s, Syria withdrew its recognition. But till now, Syria doesn't recognize West Sahara as part of Morocco. And Morocco puts a condition now on Syria that if they, if Syria wants to restore relations with Morocco, they have to recognize diplomatically, politically, and officially that West Sahara is part of Morocco. And I'm not sure if Syria is willing to do that because they don't really need Morocco now in the reconstruction process. They, the, the, the countries that are the most needed for Syria are Saudi Arabia, it's Turkey, and it's Qatar. The last country that still rejects Syria's admission to the Arab League is Kuwait. And it's a very strange situation with Kuwait because in the 90s, early 90s, Syria was on the side of Kuwait against Saddam Hussein in the process of uh, liberating Kuwait from the Iraqi occupation. But when the war erupted in Syria in 2011, Kuwait really played an, I would say, destructive role. And there were even former member of parliament from the Kuwaiti uh, parliament who came to Syria for, quote, jihad against the, quote, infidel regime in Syria. So there is an argument that says in Kuwait there is a growing Salafist scene, and these Salafists have gained influence over the decision making in uh, Kuwait in the past decade, and therefore they're refusing the Syria's admission to the Arab League. There are two recent examples for Saudi Arabia and the UAE disobeying the dictates of the United States. The first example is when Washington asked Riyadh and Dubai to increase the production of the oil, to increase the oil production cap, right? Because they wanted to harm Russia in Ukraine. When the oil prices drop, it is harming Russia. And these countries refused to obey the uh, American dictates in this regard because they found alternatives. Alternative rising powers, especially China and Russia, coming from the East. And these countries are willing to deal with Saudi Arabia and the UAE with respect and also as peers, as equals. And this is a difference of approach between Washington and the other rising powers in Moscow and Beijing, that Moscow and Beijing are willing to deal and treat other countries with respect. In contrast, the United States is now humiliating even its own allies in Europe by destroying their economies and pushing them and forcing them to join the uh, sanctions orgy, for example, against Russia, which is only harming the economy of the European countries, right? So there is this argument that these countries uh, have had enough in the past decades and they have found an alternative powers in the region or in, in the East that can fill the power vacuum of the United States in the region. The second reason is that these countries have economic interests and they are trying to plan for, uh, on a strategic level. They want to uh, plan for economies in the era or in the post oil era. And we, we know that the Saudi Arabia, for example, has its 2030 economic vision. And similarly, UAE has its own economic vision. Therefore, it's in their economic interest now to stabilize the region. And the same applies on Turkey. It's in its economic interest to stabilize the region. Unlike Washington, unlike Washington makes money, generates money from destabilize when it destabilizes the region. And the difference of approach is that China and Russia are using soft power in the region, unlike the United States that was using hard power in order to achieve its foreign po policy goals in the region, which was at the beginning the Carter Doctrine, for example, to secure the oil and energy, the flow of the oil and energy uh, to the United States and its allied uh, countries. And then it was about Israel, that Israel wanted to destroy any uh, competition, whether it's economic, whether it's political, or even military in the region. And that's when the United States intervened, for example, in Iraq. And that's why the United States is threatening Iran with uh, another military escalation, for example. This is not in the interest, the strategic interest of the United States, but rather in the strategic interests of Israel.